morning. Tis the, uh, tis the season as we get into this time of the year. Uh, we, we prepare for major holidays, but before we get to the holidays, I feel like this is intentional. There's this little hurdle that we have to get past before we get to do things like Thanksgiving and Advent and Christmas, and that is election season. I think they intentionally put it here because some of the most joyful time of the year is, is the, the family gatherings that we have in November and December and all these things. So I think they like right before that, they just have it so you know there's a beauty coming at the end. But you have to survive election season. And I don't know about you, I really do feel like we're, we're starting to talk about phrases like surviving election seasons, don't we? Uh, my, my inbox in every device I own, including my house, I think of my house as one of the devices, is inundated right now with all kinds of messages and, and calls and things. And, you know, you get the texts of, like, do you, do you hate babies? Well, then you have to, you know, you know but like, they're, they're just ridiculous texts, the way they send these. But the, my favorite of them all are, are the mailers that we get. I think, I think the mailers, whoever puts those out, they save the, like, the, the filthiest of political jargon for the mailers that come to your house, right? Which is a beautiful thing. Here's some actual things that I've gotten, mailers. You know, you get the candidate and it's, you know, so-and-so would, you know, kill puppies or whatever. You know, but here's some actual things that I've gotten of, of local people that, that are, you know, you're not supposed to vote for because they would ruin the country by these. Um, she wants to put a gun in every house in America. I don't think that's... I don't think we have a candidate who wants to do that, right? He or she wants to create a religious police state. He or she wants to kill every baby in America. He or she, one, one I, I'm not kidding, one of the flyers I got claimed that the candidate that was opposed to them was racist and wanted to deal with minorities. Like, suggesting, <laughs> like, now, is it possible that there are occasionally going to be political candidates who might be racist? Sure. But I don't know anyone run right now who's running on a platform of dealing with minorities. Okay, so maybe we can tone down the rhetoric. And here's, here's the problem I have with these mailers. I've been getting them for my whole life. But this, this year, and I'm not going to get into candidates or anything, but this year there happened to just be two candidates that are up for election whom I just happen to know personally. Right? I actually know who they are. I, I've had lunch with them. I've had meetings with these people, about political issues that relate to the church, about things that you can accomplish together, whatever it may be. But I know these people personally. And so when you do, when you have that, one of the things that you, you notice is these ad campaigns just become all the more ugly, right? It's pretty easy to see a flyer where someone's made out to be the devil incarnate and just toss it in the bin. But when you get a flyer about a person you actually know, Right? Even if you disagree with their politics, that's not what I'm getting into. But it, it's, it's different. Like, I look at it and I'm like, I, I have, I've had lunch with you. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're not trying to kill every baby out there. If you are, you've drastically changed your platform since the last time we've talked. Right? I, don't, I don't think you're actually out to make this country a worse place. And so whatever you think about the policies of any individuals that are running in the election this coming week, uh, we have to at least acknowledge that chances are if there's that much smearing and lies told about people that I happen to know, then there's probably a truth in this. I'm going to guess about 80% of the stuff that you see in political advertisements is hyper-exaggerated and hyper-ugly and blatantly untrue about the candidates across the aisle. Right? There, I, I know a lot of things about these people that are running, but, but I, I can tell you, you're, you're going to vote for them, you're not going to vote for them, but I, I can tell you that their hearts are pure. I can tell you that they want what's best for this country. They might disagree with you about what that is, but they, they're looking to make this a better place to be and exist, and, and they have a love for the people than where they're running, for whatever it is that they're running for, and they care about the community that they're in. They want to make it better. Right? But the rhetoric that we see is just so false and so ugly. We, we just, that's the world we live in, right? We have this ugly political debate and sphere all the time. And for me, it's just, it's just hard to see that happen as a follower of Christ, right? It is. Even as Christians, we, we tend to get really deep down into the muck of our political rhetoric. Don't raise your hand on this one, but be honest. How many of you have someone in this church who you avoid around election season? 
right? Like, you, you, like, have lunch all the time, but, like, September, October, November, you just, like, you just have lunch a little less because you just don't want to hear it, right? And you know, like, once the election's done, maybe they'll shut up, right? How many of you have someone in this church who you don't just don't talk to because you know what their political affiliation is, and you just don't want to hear it at all, and they'd go on all year about it? I hear the chuckles and the giggles, right? I'm still hearing the chuckles and giggles. It's like a middle school classroom in here. Right? But that's true. Even within this church, like we're not immune as Christians or really any better when we look at the world's political discourse. We like to get into the mud. We like to sling it on, uh, in person, in conversations, in our homes, in social media, wherever it is that we happen to, to be. We like to get into the muck just like the rest of the world. And, and quite frankly, man, we would probably send out some of those flyers if we're honest with ourselves. And so this, this week, it just so happens that the, the passage that we're looking at in Ecclesiastes deals with politics and, and authority. Right. If we look at the, the kind of the middle section of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, 5 through 7 kind of detail recap some of the things we've already talked about, how we don't find meaning in things like toil and work or money or, or wisdom or fame or pleasures, and all these things. But when we get to chapter 8, Solomon spends a lot of time looking at the wisdom of how we, as followers of Christ, relate to government authorities, to those who are elected to lead above us, to those who are in our charge, to those who we've made, to some degrees, sovereign in some ways. Although not fully so, because we don't have a king, right? And so this, this week, it's, it's, not, it's not, you know... I didn't plan it this way, but as we have an election two days from now, it might be worth taking a deeper look at the biblical principles of how God calls us to live in a political sphere and calls us to live under the authority of those who are above us, like them or not. Right? And so this morning we'll dive into chapter 8 together and we'll glean what I think are, are, are really three big principles when it comes to how we deal with the political world around us as Christians. And so let's stand together. And we'll read from God's word in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command, because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him, for he does not know what it is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All of this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, and when man had power over man to his hurt. And then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy places and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that, I will be, that it will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not fear before God. It's the word of the Lord. Have a seat. So there's, before we get into kind of the, the principles here, so to speak, there's one thing worth, worth noting. The way that Solomon writes this, if you, if you dig into some of the linguistical stuff and the, the context of timing when we think it was written and all these kinds of things, one of the things we learn is that there's a significant amount of, of leadership, of governing, of government that is and isn't glorifying the Lord in how they govern. And the reason that matters to us today is the principles that Solomon lays out in this text that we're going to get into are meant to apply universally across all time and all leaders. 
And so what that means for us is we don't just obey these principles. We don't just follow the Lord and trust him in this way when those who are elected above us align with our values, but we trust them even when they don't. Right? Throughout biblical history, we had all kinds of time periods where there was evil, wicked kings and rulers. And the Lord called the people all the same to relate to them as if they weren't wicked rulers. The Lord says, I put them over you. And so whoever they are, right, whether you are currently a person who goes, not my president, right, or this was the greatest president that you could have ever thought of elected, like there's a call that we have to obey these principles no matter how we might feel about the people that are over us. That's important to realize because some of the things that God calls us to do when it comes to those leaders are really hard when we just so happen to disagree with a lot of policy, right, really hard. And so, but let's keep that in mind. We are called to do it no matter who we are walking with. Principle number one. Godly wisdom, when we catch it, when we catch godly wisdom, when we can achieve it, when we can get the godly wisdom that the Lord gives us, entirely changes or should entirely change our demeanor and the way that we express ourselves in the world, politically and about authority. He starts by talking about this. Who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing? And we, we, he's asking, like, who out there actually has wisdom? Right? And the suggestion seems to be, it's almost like Solomon's setting up to ask a rhetorical question. Who is wise enough? No one. Right? But it's not no one. Because later he says, a man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed. And so there's an implication that there is the ability to have this godly wisdom. Like, we can have the wisdom of the Lord. We can, we can live in the midst of that wisdom. We can have it supplant our own wisdom. We can become wise in a godly way if we apply ourselves to do so and if we ask the Lord in. We have in our midst, as followers of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and he shapes us and he molds us. And so we can live in godly, divine, wise ways, as the Spirit enables us to do. And what Solomon is saying is, look, when you operate a life out of godly wisdom, it actually changes your face. Right? How many of you have had political conversations in the last month where both of you are smiling while you're having that conversation? Right? Even when two people who agree politically are talking about stuff, this is what it looks like. Well, you know, this is the worst thing we've ever had it because you know, I agree, it's terrible, and this person, are, right? All the conversations we have are filled with, like, filled with frowns. Like, we're always upset when we're talking about the political sphere. The only time we're not upset is for about two minutes after election day if our candidate wins. And then we go back to complaining about all the other things that need fixing, right? Every discourse you've had politically has involved both of you with at least a blank stare, if not a frown. Right? They're not happy chats. But what he's saying is the wisdom, when we apply ourselves to godly wisdom, it actually fundamentally changes our disposition and our demeanor. It allows us to engage the world and its politics and its leadership and its authority in a way that changes our face. A man's wisdom makes his face shine. It changes our face. It should shine because we have the wisdom of God. And so when we're talking about issues and, and, and bills and, and laws and all these things that we're trying to persuade and, and stuff coming on the floor and vote no on issue two. I don't even know if there's an issue two on the ballot this year. But, you know, you see those signs everywhere. When we have those conversations, we actually as Christians can have them in a whole different way because we have the wisdom of the Lord and it allows us to change the demeanor in which we have those conversations. We'll get into how exactly that happens a little bit later. But that's the first thing he does. Before he starts talking about obeying any authority or whatever we should do, he says, look, wisdom of the Lord actually changes who you are and how you interact with the world around you. If you don't have it, you're going to walk around with a frown, a hardness to yourself. You're going to have discourses that are just filled with hardness and ugliness and divisiveness. But if you have the wisdom of the Lord... You can change your face and you'll walk with, with a smile. There'll be a radiance to you as you talk about these things. Right? And so that's, that's the first principle. We, in our Christian political discourse, with ourselves and with the world around us, ought to have a different demeanor, a radiance to how we speak about things. 
because we have godly wisdom on our side. And if you pursue the wisdom of the Lord above all else, the more you do that, the more your expression and your demeanor and your attitude in terms of politics and things will change from hardness to radiance to smiles. Right? We'll get into why in a second. So that's, that's the first. We are called to change the political rhetoric in this world, to inject some love and life and flavor into it where everybody else is frowning. Number two, we are called to obey, this is the hard one, called to obey the leaders that are placed over us. That's a really hard thing. This obedience should be, and by the way, way more frequent and way more so than you think it should be. Most of us hear that we should obey our leaders. Well, yes, unless they, you know, unless we don't like what they say. Or unless it kind of goes against one of our values, maybe. Right? I mean, I, have, I, I hold this ideology, so, yeah, I don't want to obey that because, you know, you know, like, this tax is unconstitutional. You'll hear me say that. Right? I think property tax is unconstitutional. I'm like, it's like one area where I'm a libertarian. But, <laughs> but you know, like, that's exactly it. Like, we're called to obey. And so do you see me not paying my property tax? No. Right? We are called to obey our leaders far more often than you think. This obedience should occur even when we don't like it. Here's Romans 13, 1 through 2. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. This is very clear. Those who are in authority in our life today are put there by God. Even the ones you disagree with. Even the ones that are not godly. I know we hear that and we read it, but wrestle with it. The people that are elected in our country today who seem to go against biblical principle, God has put them there for a specific purpose and reason. If God didn't want them in Congress or in the White House or in the State Senate or in the mayor's office, they would not be there because God is sovereign in all things and what he desires will come to pass. We have to wrestle with the fact that there are people elected as, as leaders in our country and in our world who don't line up with the way that the, the scriptures tell us we ought to live, but God has put them there. And so he's saying, look, if you disobey them, if you, if you walk against them, you're actually going against something the Lord has instituted. That doesn't mean you can't disagree with the policies. That doesn't mean you can't articulate an argument. That doesn't mean that you can respectfully disagree with a position. But obedience to our leaders is something we are very radically called to. He's saying, look, every leader above you, God put them there. And for you to disobey them is for you to disobey the decrees of God, the things that he has done. So, does this mean... We can never disobey a government authority. Well, no, of course not. There are some exceptions, one of which we see here in Acts 5, 27 to 29. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in his name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. So there are times when we have an ability through Scripture, through God's own word to us, to disobey the civil authorities that God has put above us in, in, in the life that we lead today. And the one exception we get is when, when the civil authorities directly call us to contradict something that Scripture teaches. Now that doesn't mean that our interpretation, you know, when we look through Scripture, it's like I think when I read the Bible it says this about tax policies. And so if that person doesn't line up with those tax policies, I don't have to pay. No. But when, when the, the, the leadership that we're under is asking us to sin, to go against what God calls us to do and be and live like, we have a right to disobey. Right? When the king demanded that Daniel eat the food sacrificed to idols and engaged in worship of idols, Daniel said, no. He didn't obey. 
That's a, that's a time, there's a time for that. There's a time for us to say enough. We are not going to do what the authorities above us tell us to do. But I'll tell you something, those times are way more rare than you think. We see it in biblical examples like Daniel. We see it in modern examples like certain people in in the citizenry of Germany during World War II who refused to go along with the mass slaughter of an entire group of people. You can have accounts, there are whole books written about soldiers in the German army in World War II who refused to execute the Jews, who ran, who hid, who helped them get away, who fought for that cause. Because there are times to disobey. When they called, when the government called on them to murder innocent people, they said no. And a lot of them lost their lives for it. But they stood up and they said no. There are times when we have to do that. But I can tell you that in in the world in which we live in, in the country in which we find ourselves, that happens way less often than you think it does. That call to obey God rather than men, it's not as frequent. We have a pretty free society that we live in today. We think we're persecuted, but we're really not as much as we think we are. You have far more freedom than nearly any person who has ever lived throughout human history today in this country, religiously. But they say you can't pray in schools. Yeah, they do, and that's wrong. We should be pushing that. But you have more freedom than you ever have before. You have more freedom than your parents had. They had more freedom than their parents had. Certainly in biblical times. Right? Society used to be like this. I, I, I try to think of this. The emperor Constantine became a Christian, and all of a sudden, everyone who was in that empire was told that they are now a Christian. Can you imagine if like, our president, like tomorrow, got on the news and was like, you know, I was thinking, I think I might be Hindu. So all of you are Hindu now. That's how the world used to work. Today, we don't have that. We have freedom, right? But sometimes we have to disobey, and it's way more rare than you think. And when we have to disobey, it brings us to our third point, and that is this. The way in which you disagree with human authority is unbelievably important. Unbelievably important. What does it say in 8.3? He says, I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases, the king. That phrase, do not take your stand in an evil cause, what he's saying is, when you have to stand up to the authority, the way in which you do it, don't, don't do it in an evil way. A lot of times we like to look at the unrighteousness of our government and we, want, we match it, we, we approach it and we deal with it and we disrespect it or we disobey it in a, in a way that is just as unrighteous. Right. Half of the political conversations I find myself in is just the bashing of another candidate or review or whatever. Right. We engage as Christians politically in such an ugly manner And one of the things that we see in Scripture, whenever there is a civil disobedience, it's always done in a respectful manner. Daniel didn't go on Facebook and blast the king for his stupid policies or put up some meme about it. Daniel didn't go out into the public and talk about how sucky the king was and how awful he was and how he's ruining everybody's lives and how he probably hates children. He didn't go on a smear campaign against the king. He just respectfully said, no, I, I, can't, I can't obey that order. You know, with all, with all due respect to, to, to you, O king, I, 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 I got to obey God rather than you on this one. Right? He doesn't speak ill. He doesn't smear. He doesn't try to bury somebody with cancel culture when they don't align with his viewpoint. He simply respectfully disagrees and chooses not to obey when it's called for. And I'll I'll tell you, you'd be hard-pressed to find an example in Scripture where Christians are dealing with the authorities that aren't godly in a way that is demeaning or disrespectful. That's just not what we're called to do. This is the hardest thing in the world in which we live in today. As Christians, one of our greatest opportunities when it comes to politics, is that we actually could shed light on the way political discourse happens. 
We could disagree in ways that are respectful and insightful, and we could have conversations that are more about intelligence than it is about tearing down the person who we're trying to argue against. We could attack ideas and policies instead of people that hold them. It could be one of the greatest witnesses to the Christian world, to the world around us as Christians, sorry. If we were a people who, as Christians, were known for having elevated political discourse. So when the world runs around and smears everybody and tries to belittle everything and reduce everything to memes and little postcards, we could be better. We could say, no, listen, that's not how we talk about so-and-so. Well, who'd you vote for? Well, I voted for so-and-so. Yeah, that's probably right. That person was awful. Well, they're not awful. They're just, here's some of the specific ideas that I just... I think this was a better candidate choice, and that's just who I went with. And, you know. and so that's, that's the first. We, we can do that by raising the bar of conversation. We should be known as the most level-headed, non-despairing, non-attacking, non-violent, loving discourse people in the conversations that we have politically. Every time... I watch, watch a, a conversation between Christians and other people where they're smearing a candidate or throwing some ugly meme about how so-and-so is senile or an idiot on Facebook. It just makes me cringe. I'm like, why? You, you have an opportunity to demonstrate something about how our king works. Right? Why'd you waste it? Elevate your conversations. Now, here's the thing. That is really, really, really hard to do. Really hard, right? Derek Kidner says this. There are times when, this is a prequel, wisdom has to fold its wings and take the form of discretion, content to keep its possessor out of trouble. If we operate with the wisdom of the Lord, there are times in the midst of that that we have to just be willing to be quiet on something that we really want to just throw our nugget into. That we have to choose to have discretion in political conversations because it just doesn't have to be said that particular time in that particular instance. We can trust the Lord that it'll be okay and we can have a conversation that is loving and know that he'll still somehow keep the world spinning. Here's what helps make all of this go. This is what I call the spoon that makes the medicine go down. This is, we, we already read this, but this is Ecclesiastes 8, 10 through 13. After all this conversation about what we're supposed to do, Solomon is, is reflecting back and he says this, this phrase, then I saw the wicked buried. Right? The, the language suggests that Solomon was probably actually attending some kind of a, a funeral of a wicked leader or funerals where he had seen a couple and he's collecting his thoughts. But he's saying this, listen, I started to notice all of the wicked people, like I, I saw their funerals. Right? They were, they're dying. They used to go in and out of the holy places and they were praised in the city where they had done such things. This is also vanity because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong the days like a shadow because he does not fear God. Here's what Solomon's saying. He says, look, I was noticing that these wicked people are, you know, I went to some of their funerals, and man, it's really frustrating to deal with wicked leaders in the world because it seems like they just get, kind of get to march around and have it their way. It doesn't seem like they get justice for their wickedness, right? The people that should be losing elections are winning elections, maybe for the seventh time, right? Like, could we get that person in their 80s out of Congress already? We've been trying to vote them out for years, and they just keep coming back. They keep getting their way. This world does not seem fair. The wicked seem to prosper, and the righteous seem to struggle. But man, I'm noticing something. Like, all those wicked people are dying. And, and I think, you know, there, there's a trust that I have that after death, that there is, in fact, a justice on the other side of that. He says, that, you know, it would seem to me that, that eventually those who trust and fear the Lord are raised up and prosper, and those who, who don't struggle and are judged and are cast out. Right? What Solomon is talking about is the judgment that comes at the end of our days. He's saying, look, whatever the world might seem like to you, whatever happens with with good and bad politicians or good and bad people under the sun in this world, I'm noticing all of them are dying, 
right? Like, and, and, and I think the Lord deals with them eventually. So there is a final justice in a way, but it's his, it's not ours. Right? There, there is a time that will come where the Lord will judge every authority that has ever ruled over you and over me. And so the people that are in authority over you right now that you go, yeah, I can't get behind them. The Lord is saying, listen, just obey them. I have them there for a reason. Well, I don't know what that reason could possibly be. Well, it's not your problem to know what the reason is. I am God and I know. Just obey them and trust me that I will deal with it on my own time, in my own way, and that my way is perfectly just and perfectly righteous. Every single bad authority that has ever lived has or will be judged by God, either through wrath or through grace, just like you and I receive it. They will. As Christians, we have that hope. We live as a people that are not a citizen of this world, but are an alien in this place. We're, we're guests here. This I have news for you. I don't care if you're a veteran. This is not your country. You are a guest in this place. Your country is where you're going to go after you die. That is your home. This is a holding tank. And it's a time, it's a breath, it's a vapor, to use some of the Ecclesiastes language, in comparison to the eternity that you will spend with your Father who is in heaven. And while you are here, you are called to conduct yourself in a certain way that signifies and shows the world that you, in all of the muck and the mess, trust the Creator to do what He says He's going to do. And so in our discourse, we can be free. We don't have to win every political argument. We don't have to win every election in our favor and in our way because it doesn't matter because God will be in control. All of the wrongs that you're so terrified of happening if whatever candidate you don't like loses on Tuesday or wins on Tuesday, all of those wrongs are going to be righted again. There's nothing that they could do that would destroy the world in such a way that God can't redeem it. There is nothing that can happen this Tuesday that God is not in complete, utter, 100% control of. And if you as a Christian in, it just can, can get that into your heart and into your head, man, we don't have to argue. We don't have to be ugly and divisive. We don't have to be Republicans and Democrats and Independents and Libertarians and whatever, Socialists or whatever. We can be followers of Christ who say, whatever principalities govern this world, I am a follower of the principality that will govern the world after. And the one who's pulling all the strings. If so-and-so gets elected, I'm not a fan of those policies, but guess what? If the Lord, for whatever reason, is seeing it fit that I should live under them, I will live out the gospel as best as I can under those circumstances. And I will do so with the wisdom of the Lord that tells me he's in control, and so I will have joy in my heart, and you will see nothing but that from me out in the world. That's it. That's what we're called to do as Christians in the political realm. And man, I can tell you, if we did that, the world wouldn't know what to do with us. They would be baffled. Can you imagine if there were no Christians having ugly political discourse? Just, just imagine that world for a second, where everything out there is just crazy, and these mailers are coming out, and every single person who proclaims to be a follower of Christ is different and says, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. Well, but, 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 but if so-and-so loses, we'll lose all of our rights. Yeah, but I serve the one who can bring them all back. They'll, he'll, he'll deal with them. I don't have to. Right? And so what does that do? It enables us to, to vote and to, to talk about politics in a way that f is freeing. We can actually look at the issues and just vote our conscience. And so that's, that's what I'm going to ask you to do on Tuesday. I'm going to ask you to be very intentional when you go into that election booth. And I want you to do a couple things. Number one, I want you to wake up on Tuesday morning and I want you to start with prayer. I want you to start by praising the God who made you and who made every person on the ballots and who is sovereign over all things and who carries you forth. 
want you to praise him for his sovereignty and for his control and for the fact that you serve the one who holds all things together. And then I want you to continue thanking God for granting you divine wisdom to go into the election booth and to to, to fill out the bubbles that you most think are are right. Right? Whatever whatever party they might belong to. I want you to praise the Lord that he gives you through his Holy Spirit wisdom to be able to think about these things. And then I want you to do your due diligence right, about the candidates who you, who you want to elect. I want you to think about what they stand for, what their thoughts are, what they're going to do, what they're promising, how, whether they can actually do what they're promising or not. Most of them can't. right? And, and I want you to think about which one of them on either side of the aisle lines up the most with a godly vision for the world that we live in and that you can trust and get behind, whether it's your preference or not, right? And then, and then fill in that bubble, and then praise the Lord for the ability that we have as a free country to elect, and then you, I want you to walk out, and I want you to live the rest of the day in complete and utter peace. And when you go to work, and people are talking about who they voted for, if you want to tell people, great. If not, don't tell them. But, but instead of talking about candidates, proclaim the hope that you have. You said, you know, it's great. Whatever the results are tonight, I'm going to be at peace. I'm going to sleep like a baby because I, I've already made my, my election, right? I've already made my choice, right? And in the end, the only vote that matters in this room that you ought to cast is the vote for the one person who truly is the sovereign over all things, and that's for Jesus Christ. And he's the one we ought to be voting for on Tuesday. He's the only one we ought to be worried about voting for on Tuesday. And if we do that, if we can do that as a people of God, even just as this church, Man, it will raise the discourse in the world around us, and it will cause people to look at us and go, man, how can you have so much hope in the midst of all that uncertainty? Because I can tell you, the world puts their faith in the people on the ballot boxes, and we put our faith in the one who made them. That's it. So this Tuesday, do that. Think through that. Be that way. Spend time in prayer. And then live out that grace in the world around you so that people might start to ask questions. Because I can guarantee you, you will stand out. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that in the world that is divided, that you are the one person who truly unifies. We thank you that in a world that puts their faith in leaders, we put our faith in the only one who created the universe. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to worry. Lord, every one of us has a a tendency towards fear based on who happens to hold office that particular cycle. We worry. We worry about policies. We worry about whether the church will have continued freedom or not. And the truth is that most of biblical times, your church operated with really no freedom. But guess what? You carried your church. In a world hostile to you, you multiplied your church by the thousands daily. And we know that you can do it again. So we ask for wisdom. We ask that we would increase and abound in trust of you. We ask that we are presented with opportunities to have conversations around politics that that bring light to a hopeless world. We ask for patience as we deal with that one coworker or relative or friend that we have that we know is just going to rub us the wrong way, Lord, help us be filled with grace and mercy and love this week more than any other. We love you and we praise you. And together, all of God's people said, Amen.